Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. We're glad you decided to check us out. God has a specific message of hope for your life and mine today. So listen up. Good morning. Thank you for coming to this last week of our Modern Family series. I'm Jim Campbell. I'm the lead pastor here, and I want to say welcome and so glad you came to be a part of our family uh, this week. You know, during this series, we've really been trying to talk about some of the modern challenges of families. You know, we've dealt with, with your marriage. We've dealt with having a strong marriage. We've dealt with divorce. And how do you rebound after that? You know, we've dealt with blended families and the challenges that come with blending two families. We've been dealt with empty nester families. Uh, Bruce and Valerie did a great job talking about our, our empty nesters and how once your, once your kids have grown and moved on, how do you keep it going and keep a great family environment for them as well? But I want to talk about something very important today especially. Um, you know, one of the most increasing, one of the increasingly common components in our, in our family structure in America really is a situation of foster parenting and adoption. You know, there are about 135,000 kids that are adopted every year. I mean, that's a, that's a massive amount. But the truth is, there are almost 500,000 kids in the foster system every, on any given day. And closer upwards toward a million run in and out of the system throughout the course of a year here in the United States. So there's a lot. There's a lot of kids, you know, in this system. And the truth is that taking care of children is important to God. I don't know where you realize that or not, but it's all throughout the Bible. You know, Deuteronomy 10 talks about that he, he defends the cause of the fatherless. You know, that's how it's describing God in Psalm 86, Psalm 68, 5. It talks about that God is the father of the fatherless and protector of widows. That's God in his holy habitation. Not only that, but in James, uh, James 1, the writer, James talks about that, that religion that God accepts, one of the qualifications is to care for orphans. One of the first things he talks about is caring for orphans. So God cares about children. And I wanted to talk about this today. We have two members of our, of our church that are, that are foster parents. We have other members that have been at times and back and forth. You know, many and Chris have. But uh, Hector and Vicki Rodriguez, if you guys would come up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about their experience in fostering and adoption. Come on up. Yep, 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 yep. Right now. You two guys. Okay. <laughs> come on. <laughs> I called them and asked them to do that. It's like, they were like, okay, we'll, we'll do it. But hey, come up and have a seat, guys. There's a mic here for each one of you right there. Uh, to, at the beginning of the sermon, talk about this. I want to just talk about a little bit about how, about fostering, you know, and adoption by just interviewing them about their experience in that. And, um, you know, so how long have you guys been fostering, um, been foster parents? Well, just keep Mike right up close, real close. Yeah, it's about six years, so what, 2013 or so? Well, how, how, did, you get, how did you get started with that? How did you get started with, the, with, with fostering? Um, it all started, Jim, when we used to assist our previous church. There were some parents there that were foster parents, and we used to look at them with all these kids, and Vivian and I were like, is that something that might interest us? She asked me, actually, and I'm like, you know, we have so many kids in the house and stuff like that. <laughs> How are we going to do this? But the Lord had different plans. Excellent, He's, excellent. He said, you guys are doing this, and we're doing it. That's excellent. That's excellent. I tell you, um, what, was the, what was the process like? You know, when you, got, you said, okay, this is what God has for me and, and our family. You know, kind of what, where, what, where did you do next? What was the process like of getting started in that? But first of all, you go to a, um, what's the word, the uh, orientation. orientation, and then uh, from there, if you feel this is something you want to do, and they, they give it to you straight up. There is pros and cons on being a foster parent. You get mm -hmm. some kids sometimes that 
they're not the easiest kids to deal with. So they kind of, stop, you get a little scared, but from there, if you, it's something you want to do, then you go through the whole process of becoming foster parent. Well, I know it can be difficult because I know one of the things, you know, that, that I learned early on, man, my wife, my wife read, read a book, actually. <laughs> it's okay. No worries. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, my wife read a book, actually talked about the consistency that you need as a parent, you know, and how it needs to be for, you know, for kids and stuff. Uh, they need a consistent environment. So I can imagine it's difficult because you're talking about kids are being uprooted and placed in another home with people they don't know. I mean, kind of what is the, why, why don't we, what is fostering per se? I mean, maybe we may have somebody out there who doesn't even realize what that really is. What, how would you define that? That's just when someone's in need. And um, what, what, is, what is that? Well, to us, it would be like um, just being um, parents to children who are in bad situations. They have parents, but some parents are in trouble. They don't know how to parent. They still want to live their own lives. Um, fortunately, some may be addicted uh, to drugs or alcohol, and they fight. Uh, some parents are violent, mm. and the children are just a product of the violence in the house. And they just need someone to give them some stability or to show them that there is a different way that a household is run. It's not always hitting and screaming and fighting and throwing out and drinking and drugs. Yeah, and I imagine it, and it, it's a temporary situation with you guys, right? It's meant to be temporary, so it's, it's kind of... to help the parents see them through classes. Um, mm -hmm. I guess maybe kind of like um, if you lose your children, that'll be the motivation to accept the classes. And they, and they help a lot. They put parents through rigorous things. They give up to a year. And if it's just not going to happen, then it's simply the judge will step in and determine parental rights and the mm -hmm. children. Well, I know it's, it's interesting because, I mean, we, we, we have, you have to take a test to be able to drive a car. You have to take a test to do so many things. You have to be certified, but you don't have to be parents. And a lot of people jump into parenting, and they don't have the skill necessary to do it. Now, we follow Christ, and we believe that, you know, God will provide that either through friends or something as we seek Christ, you know, as we're parents. You know, I don't know anybody who's, who knows everything about all the challenges that you have with kids. But we believe God's wisdom helps us with that. But, you know, sometimes it's just some skills that people need to learn. And, and, so, and not everyone follows Christ and has that opportunity. Um, you know, and you guys, um, you also have adopted two boys, um, Matt and Joseph, you know, who are awesome over there. You know, I played tennis with you guys last week, so you're awesome. Um, and, and you didn't kill me. I had no heart attack or no heat stroke because you're running me around all over the place. But um, what, what was the... Um, what was different um, in the process of adoption, for fostering versus adoption? How did that, how did that work differently? Well, when you're taking the courses, um, adoption and fostering are exactly the same, except if a parent's intention is to adopt, then they don't have to be licensed to foster. They just go through um, the adoption process, and, but they are taught the same as we are because their children are gonna come with mm -hmm. habits that they're not used to. And a lot of the children hide their um, bad habits. Some of them don't understand. They just were not raised the way they weren't taught how to do certain things. So they emulate different houses. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when you get to a house that you're going to stay in, they're just looking for the next shoe to drop. So you're taught how to watch for these signs. Mm -hmm. With Matthew and Joe, Honestly, sometimes I tell Hector that God placed us in the fostering because they were supposed to be ours. Mm. And they were just the second pair of children that we had had. Mm. And we weren't going to adopt our age. We just wanted to give people a safe, a safe place. Mm. But Matthew and Joe was very different. And, uh, awesome. They let just kind of like... Uh, <laughs> let, let me add to this, uh, Jim. Um, the situation of Matthew and Joseph was kind of unique. Coming from the judge's chamber that knew their parents as too good, let's say, because of all the situations that they had put the system through. Mm -hmm. And in their case, it's one of those, like usually they don't give the parents as much time to try to get their kids back as they gave this set of parents. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was about three and a half years Wow. before the system said enough is enough. 
They and, were just waiting uh, for us. <laughs> yeah, and after that, they found out where the kids were. They used to come to our house. It was one of those we involved the police and this and that. And when it came time, for the, they were going to take the kids away from our house because of all the complaints and this and that. And we looked at each other and said, like, we're not going to let this happen. They would have went from home to home, They're probably uh, no they, fault of their own. They're probably not even going to be out of state because of the situation of the wow. parents and stuff. And So there they are. There they are, and yeah. they're the, the, the most best. awesome <laughs> children anyone could The best decision we ever made. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, especially, you know, getting to know Matt and Joe, I mean, I'm just more impressed every day by the young men they are. Serious, straight up. I mean, you know, I, I tell Katie all the time, you know, I'm just, I'm impressed by you guys and who you are and the men that you're becoming, you know, and I'm impressed by you guys. I appreciate you so much, you know, thinking toward that and, and being willing, you know, because, and now, because I can imagine there's, there's challenges now because you still foster. And now you have two kids in the home. Um, but so there's some challenging and challenges in, in that. So what are some of those challenges that you have to balance there between you know, having kids in the home and fostering? Uh, we've had challenges when we take on girls mm. because of the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because they all fall in love with my handsome son. And then <laughs> <laughs> um, the challenge is also uh, making everything equal. It, it's the same as, you know, children versus grandchildren and, and everybody. So you have to have your house run equal, but at the same time involve uh, Matt and Joe and my biological children. Cause yeah, because you also, have children all right, as we well. We have yeah. uh, adult children in their 30s, and they get jealous too because they feel. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of just rounding everything out and make, uh, creating a balance. and. Um, we just pray a lot and God gives us the answers and uh, so far, you know, if we have a, a, a child that's very challenging, then mm -hmm. we actually apologize to Matt and Joe and uh, ask them to help us and ask them what would they do in that situation so it'll better help us to treat that one child. That's cool and I love that because that's, in a lot of ways, you're discipling Matt and Joe in that situation as well. You're training them to think of others first and, and it shows it shows um what are some of the rewards of foster parenting you know well Mama, matt told us to give us a shout out <laughs> <laughs> uh he him and joe are the biggest rewards um. <laughs> cool <laughs> one Excellent. of the biggest rewards jim is uh when you have a kid that walks into your home let's say for the first time and they look at you that they don't trust anybody in this world hmm. and all of a sudden when these kids walk into our household, we tell them, you guys are gonna be treated the same as everybody in this house. Hmm. So, right there, they look at us like, okay, so we never been told this. And when they start trusting us, and that first time that you get a hug from one of those kids, mm -hmm. it breaks your heart. Yeah, or a mm -hmm. mom and dad. <laughs> mm. So that's one of the biggest mm. rewards. Cool. What's some of the what's some of the toughest challenges? What are the things that people don't see that you guys have to deal with? Answering the phone in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the two a.m. call. Yeah. yeah. You told me that's when the, that's when you know when the bars close. Be ready. Bars close you know. at one, and when they get home, starts whatever battles. The arguments, and then the kids get taken out of the household. Yeah. Also. Actually, them walking in starts the challenge because you really don't, um, they don't have a lot of ideas unless the child is coming from another home of a, a foster parent that might have decided to give up their license, mm. then they can tell you all about the child. But if the child's being uh, just placed from one home to another, a lot of the behaviors that come with it, they don't tell you. And the kids go through what they call a honeymoon period while they, they start checking everything out. Mm -hmm. And slowly you start seeing their personalities and it's, it's, it is challenging and uh, if you're a working parent, it's hard because you have a 72 hour window in which you have to get them registered in school, uh, doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, and um, the judge can just turn around and say three o'clock that evening saying um, they're going to grandma or to auntie and you've just done all of this. Mm -hmm. So there's just certain things and 
children come with what Matt calls a crew. Hmm. They have tutors and they have mentors and they have caseworkers and they have their own therapists and attorneys and guardian at litem and they all come to your house. So a lack wow. of privacy is something you have to just deal with. A lot of appointments and each kid comes with all those things. So if you have five children, then you have all these people coming in and out of your house. And they're not all coming at the same time, hand on their wrists. No, if they're <laughs> siblings, maybe, but if they're just separate children, it's each. Yes. You always talk about the hospital. You're in the hospital and everybody comes right when you're ready to fall asleep. Then they want to do a test. Yeah, I mean, much. you know, I can see, you know, that here. Sometimes if you have more than one kid, there might be uh, two of them at the same time mm -hmm. at the house with each kid. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just to see each, uh, a particular kid and the appointments are done individually. So, I mean, if, let's say somebody felt like um, that God was calling them to foster parent, be foster parents, what, would, what step, what's, what's the first step that they need to take? What should they expect? You know? uh, well, the first step is to call Brevard Family Services mm -hmm. and ask them where their next orientation meeting is. And you guys have, y'all brought some handouts yeah, this morning. Brought some handouts in case deal. anyone's interested to read. Yep. Uh, if you pass the orientation, and it's not a test, I shouldn't say pass, but they are, they, they tell you the pros and cons. They're, they don't sugarcoat anything because these are children, these are people, this is not a puppy, you know. So they tell you what to expect, what not to expect. You could be pleasantly surprised. You know, me and Hector, we've had challenging children, but at the end of the day, it wasn't as hard as they said it was going to be. But, you know, we also pray a lot, and we feel that our home has a lot of peace. Mm. So when they come in and they have a behavior that we don't like, then we, I ask. I ask God to judge, to, to, to lead me in how to take care of this child. And sometimes I can be rough on a child um, because I need them to get angry and tell me what it is that is actually bothering them. Mm. And then we can just sit down, cry, and air it out. So they tell you all of these things. And um, if you're willing to go the next step, there's 27 hours of classes. It's... I think it's eight weeks, could be six, but I think it's eight weeks, twice a week. And it's the same thing, how to parent, what to expect. Um, and you're never alone. I mean, the, it, it's, it's just like church, the community of brothers and sisters. Foster parents are very tight. If you get to know them, there's a parent out there that can give you answers. You mm -hmm. know, I have parents that stop me and say, you know, if you need me, here's my number. I don't even know them, you know, so. Well, do you guys have any words of advice for someone who might be considering foster parenting? What's a, what's a word of advice for them? Well, Jim, I will say if anybody has ever thought of being a foster parent, just like you said, the numbers you said earlier there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of kids in need out there, and they need help. Yep. And on a daily basis, there's kids being taken out of their homes, and they need people like us to help them. Yeah, and you just have to have, what is it, Matt? An open mind yeah. and an open heart. <laughs> <laughs> open mind and open heart. <laughs> that's Matt's job. <laughs> that out. Well, that's awesome, guys. I tell you what, let me, let me pray for you guys, because um, this is a ministry. I know you right now, you're, you're, you're fostering a small, a, a small young man, very, a young baby who, is, who yeah, wants, to be, the, wants well, to be the boss. Yeah. Well, know? actually... Um, yeah. There's also another uh, section of foster parenting. It's called medical foster parenting. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's a different, it's the same license, but it's a whole set of courses. Um, and it's, it's a little bit different. And um, you have to qualify, um, like you have to take uh, continuing education classes. I forgot to say, you have 12 hours, so it's once a month, and they help you with that too. And you have to get relicensed every year, uh, fingerprinting, background checks. Everyone in the house has to go through that. It's not that difficult. Um, home studies, so like I said, every, everybody helps you. So the child that I have is a medical child. They don't run through the same system, even though I do talk to the same people. So we actually are double foster parents in that. And yes, uh, those children are challenging because they're sick. So yeah. you have to have a, a whole different set of uh, patients for that. I'll tell you what, let me pray for you guys. Um, if y'all would, join me in prayer. Um, you, you guys can say right there. I'm just going to come over behind you here. Um, just join me in prayer. God, I thank you so much for Hector and Vicky. And Lord, I thank you for the calling you put in their lives. Lord, I thank you for the way you've gifted them, Father, even ways that they may not even realize. 
when they started, but you've made them the people that you wanted them to be for this time, for these children, for this area. Lord, give them confidence and boldness. Lord, that your Holy Spirit will direct them in any way that they need to. Lord, and help us, you know, as the family of faith to come alongside, to pray for, be vigilant, to pray for, to be an example, Father, of how to, how to follow Christ for the, for the children that they bring into our fellowship of faith, even maybe it's for a short time. Lord, I thank you for their heart to adopt. And Lord, I thank you for Joe and for Matt and the wonderful kids that they are. And uh, Lord, I pray blessing on this whole family. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks so much, guys. Y'all can just leave them out there. Just put them I want to share just a little bit quickly here right at the end um, a bit about adoption. You may, you may know or not, if you're, if you're new, you may not know that I was adopted. My parents adopted me when I was three days old. I was born in Daytona Beach, Florida, and they came down at three days and picked me up and carried me kicking and screaming back up to Alabama where I grew up on a farm. And, um, I, I, and, and so adoption has been very formative in my life. You know, everything from what I eat to what I, what way I view the world to how I think laundry what I think about laundry. It's formulated through adoption because my, my parents adopted me and, and who they are just completely shaped the person that I am. And even though you may not have, you may know someone who is adopted or may some, know someone who is adopted and you may not have personally experienced adoption, but I wanted to tell you that adoption is an extremely, extremely important thing to our faith. Because whether you may realize it or not, you have been shaped by adoption, especially if you follow Christ. You know, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. One of the things you have to understand is adoption has touched each and every one of us because adoption is the method by which we enter the kingdom of God. Do you realize that? If you've been saved, you are an adopted child of God. Now, some people think a lot of times that we kind of make up the con concept of God, you know, to kind of fill in the cracks for the things that we don't understand. But I tend to believe it's the opposite. See, I believe God created the world to help us understand who he, he is and what our relationship with him is supposed to be. You know, he creates all kinds of things. And when you look around the world, you realize, you know, you're, look, you're not looking at just stuff that's in the world. But when you start to realize that, you start to realize, look, at, when I look at that tree, when I look at that road, when I look at that house, when I see that home, when I see this situation, this relationship, this is all something that God created in some way to use to teach me about who he is and to proclaim his glory. You know, and it's, it goes deeper than that. It's not just concepts and things. God creates actual matter and actual stories and history and, and life, life patterns and life journeys that illustrate who he is. You know, it's, it's kind of like our, our world is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. And we have to look at the world in that way. You know, you never are presented with something that God can't teach you something through. So be, grasp it, grab a hold of it. You know, one of the things in 2 Corinthians 6, 8, 3, 8, 6 18, and it says, and I, this is kind of what God means by adoption. It says, and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. And what Paul does in writing to the church at Corinth there, it's kind of references back to the Old Testament. And he says, look, this is God's intention. When he, because I talked about it, when he talked about adoption in Romans, he talks about adoption, and this is kind of what he's talking about. This is the intention of God, that you will be his sons and daughters. You know, my mom talked to me all the time. She said, look, you know, Jim, we, we, so we wanted you. We, we had to work hard for you. We had to pay a lot of money. We had to go through home studies. We had to travel to another state. They had to deal with stuff with the state department and legal situations that was hard for them. You know, but here's the thing about adoption that's wonderful. Adoption means you were selected. Do you realize that? Every person in here who, is, who has a relationship with Christ, God selected you. He didn't get stuck with you. 
He wanted you desperately. When I was a kid, my parents told me I was adopted before I even knew what the word meant. I, would, I wore it like a title. It was like a crown. You know, I mean, I would walk up and I would say to somebody, I was like two or three, and they would tell me, I'd walk up to somebody and go, hi, I'm Jim, I'm adopted. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. I, I just knew that it was important. And I appreciate my parents so much for putting, instilling that in me because when I came to understand the adoption of, Christ, of being adopted into God's family, that was a badge of honor. That was something I was proud of. You know, think about it in your life. Are you, le- that my lead story was I'm adopted. Is your lead story with the people you know, if you follow Jesus, that you're adopted by Christ? That God thought enough of you to adopt you. Is that your lead story? You know, adoption is not something that as a child you can make happen on your own. You know, I couldn't just walk up at Ann Am- and James's house and go, hello, here's my little hobo pack, or my backpack, and I'm, you know, I'm adopted now. You know, they had to do that for me. They, they had to use their resources to take care of that, of that for me. There was a cost involved in adopting me. And the same is true with you and I. When we're adopted into, into God's family, there's a cost involved in that. I can't do that on my own. God has to take care of that. In Galatians 4, 4, and 5, it says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman and subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Our adoption comes through Jesus Christ. You know, through it, we, have, we have no resources to execute that on our own. Anybody tells you you can save yourself, you can't. You absolutely cannot. It can only be done by, by God through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, adoption comes at a high price too. It comes at the life of Jesus. You know, adoption also is an agreement that's based on a promise. It's an agreement that's based on a promise. You know, my parents had to make commitments. They had to sign papers. You guys probably did. had to sign papers. I agree that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I agree to do this. I'm putting my name down on the line that I'm gonna do this. I, I agree. I promise. I'm writing this down, this agreement that I will, I promise I will take care of this child in this way. You know, and that's what God, God does for us. It's a promise. In Galatians 3.29 you know, Paul writes this, he says, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. See, when God brings you into his family, you, there's a set of promises and agreements that God says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do it. And they're all through his word. That's why you need to read God's word so much, because God has put so many things in there for you and I to know about what we can trust to live in our life. And I, I see Christians all the time and they don't, they don't get that. They're not reading in God's word. They're not seeing what God is saying, I'm gonna do for you. And I see people who are in, in, in the, they, they have no joy in their life because they don't realize that God's gonna take care of something that, and it's basically because of something they're afraid of. I'm afraid of this situation or that situation or what's gonna happen here. And they don't realize that God's already promised, I'm gonna take care of you. If you trust me, and I've seen people at times in their, in their despair miss the answer and miss the, miss the direction that God's going to do. And when, when they miss a situation and to make the situation harder on them, when they, if they had listened to God, not only would they make it through the situation better, but they would also see God's victory and God's glory. And that would be something that would go from being a hard situation in their past to a victory that God achieved that they bring up. Kind of like, I'm Jim, I'm adopted. I bring up the situation. God did this for me. And it becomes your lead story. Don't miss that. You know, it's, and, the, and here's the cool thing, is when Paul was talking about the word adoption, see, there's not a word for adoption in the Hebrew language. I don't know if you know that or not, but there's not. When Paul talked about adoption, he was prop- talking about from the Roman concept. You know, he was a Roman citizen. And here's a cool thing about the Roman concept of adoption. While you could have, like say, I could have a natural son, and if that son was a stinker, and we got really at odds, I could disown that son, and I could push him away. But here's the thing. If you adopted a child under the Roman government, you could not legally disown that child. You were stuck with them for life. You see, and when, when God adopts us into his family, when God adopts us into that, we can't save ourselves. It's not my resources that makes me adopted, but I also can't unsave myself. Because God has put me to be, brought me to be a part of his family. I'm locked in. You know, people who didn't know me often said, Jim, you look like your dad. I see where he gets that or whatever. And, and, I, and we're not even blood related, right? You know, my dad passed away 15 years ago, almost 16. Um, I was 15 this month, actually. You know, last week. Um, 
But, um, you know, my, I, 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 the, the reason that I looked like my dad was because I did things the way he did it. I learned to walk the way he walked. I had his gait. I learned to lift things the way he lifted them. I learned facial expressions from him and all those type of things. And that, but it was much, much deeper than that. You know, Jesus said, you know, in, in uh, John 13, 15, Jesus tells his followers, look, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. So Christ has set an example spiritually. Physically, I'm looking at my dad how to do everything. You know, and it's even deeper than that. I'm not looking at just how to do it. I'm looking at him how to think about things. You know, his, his views on the world shaped who I am. You know, and shaped how I believe and how I think and all of those views. It's a deeper, deeper thing. You know, even things that I didn't even realize were happening, I do like my dad. I sit down a, on a couch and I throw, my, I throw my arm up over my head sometimes and lean into the corner. And all of a sudden I realized sitting at home, this was, a few years, this was several years ago when my dad was alive. You know, I was sitting like that and I realized I'm looking over there and there's my dad doing the same thing. That's where I got it. I didn't even know. You know, and the same is true for us. It's not just looking at God and going, I'm going to try so hard to be like Jesus. You know, 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us this. It says, and we who have unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. That just means that what God sends to us reflecting God's glory, we're just trying to be mirrors and reflect that back out to other people. But we're being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. And what they're saying is supernaturally, you and I are being transformed into the image of God. It's not about us trying to keep Jesus' rules, but as we hang out with Jesus, as we follow him, his Holy Spirit works inside of us, and he changes us to naturally want to be, to naturally react to things the way that he does. And we become more like Christ without having to try as much. You know, that's why I laugh when people say, oh, it's just a bunch of rules. Well, not necessarily. I'm trying to be like Christ, but as I do, God changes me, and it's not a rule anymore. It's just who I am. You know, also, adoption entitles us to an inheritance, and this is extremely important. My dad passed away. He left me stuff, and it was not just physical stuff. I mean, there was, there was things I had to take care of. There was business that I had to do. You know, it was much more than, than possessions, really. You know, my dad was, was a well-respected man in our community in Alabama. And when he left me his name, I mean, there are people, I, I, I gain privilege from that because when people know that I'm James's son, when I go home, you know, they, they look at me different. There's a respect that I get. But there's also a responsibility, you know, as well. It's like, it's not, he left me a physical legacy and all this. And the same is true with God. You know, in Romans 8, 17, it says, this is at the end of that verse, it says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Truth is, there's a responsibility with the inheritance that we get. Do you realize that every bit of glory that you accumulate for God, he's, Christ is going to share that in some way with you? Now, there'll never be a situation where, you know, like someone, like God's going to die and then leave it all to you. It's not going to happen like that. He's always going to be here. He's always going to be around. He's always going to be making the final calls. I mean, you won't be left there doing it all on your own. But as an heir of Christ, it may, it, what, it, what being an heir to Christ is, it means that you share his glory. You share that glory. And God meets your physical needs as well. See, when, Christ, when my father gave me, there were, he left me, there was business to run. There was people that I had to respect. There was people that I had to take care of. You know, there, were, there was responsibility for maintaining his name and good standing. When my father left me, we, had, we made plans together about how it was going to be after he left. And it was my responsibility to carry those on. You know, in Luke 12, 48, Jesus said this. He's just been sharing a bunch of parables. And he says this. He says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. But from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And that's the end of a bunch of parables where it talks about, you know, seeking how the foolishness of seeking riches and all that and making that the most important thing in your life. But he says, look, for everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. You know, we've been given so much. And we tend to think of that as financial a lot of the times when we think about, oh, much has been given. You know, much will be required. You know, there's a rich guy. He should get it done. But the truth is we're all beyond rich in what God has given us beyond the possessions that we have. It's in the people that we, who we are. We've been entrusted with so many things. We've been given a responsibility. We've been uh, given wisdom. God's, God's crafted a life path for us to give us experience. We've been given love. We've been shown the example of love in Jesus. He provides for us. Matthew 6, read it again. 
But most of all, we've been given the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that this is available to anyone he calls and brings forward, anyone willing to give their life to Christ. We've been given that. My goodness, that is the greatest riches of Do you realize that you can take, you have what within you, you've given the possession of the information and the relationship and God's given you the ministry of reconciliation to help other people know of what will take care of their life physically from here to the end of their life, emotionally, physically, socially, and their eternity from here to forever. And we've been given that. And when God says, look, much is going to be asked of you because I have given you everything. And I have given this to you. And I have left this in your hands. And I want to work on this with you. See, in light of this, it's all connected to the mission that God's given us. You know, we make disciples here and everywhere for the glory of God. That's our mission. You know, that's why it's important. God has given us this opportunity. And he's given every person in your life, is an in, in your influence circle, everybody you know, everybody you talk to, everybody that, you have, uh, that you, you're friends with, God's put them in your life because he's like, look, I'm going to use you in some way to help them understand more about the gospel, either through their life, or either through what I tell you and they see in your life, or you're going to sit down and talk to them about it. You're going to share this with them. Loads of ways. You're part of that story. So everything you look, I want you to think about everybody that you know and every place that you go and and everywhere you have influence and power, understand that God put you there. He put you there. And he gave you the greatest thing he could possibly ever give and says, I want you to give that to everyone around you. That's my plan. No one is exempt from that. No one. Not one believer is exempt. So I can sit up in the corner. Somebody else is going to do that, you know? I like, no. Everyone. Everyone has been given that to share. And everyone has been given friends. Because here's the truth. The people that you know and the people that you hang out with and the people that you have influence over, I don't have the same influence that you do. I can't tell them the way you can tell them. I can't say it the way you can say it. God can communicate it so much better through you to them when he's got a specialized tool that has been installed in their life that he can say, look, here it is. And he has given that to you and to me. This adoption process is amazing. And here's the truth. When you adopt a child, you're participating in a holy illustration. You've been given a lifetime, a lifetime of illustration about who God is to you. You know that? Now through today, you look at this, maybe somebody in here has thought, you know, I've never thought about adoption. I've never thought about fostering or something like that. How can I help be like my dad and take care of kids? One of them, you can pray. That's a good answer for you. You can pray. You can ask God, hey, you know, what do you want me to do? That always needs to start there. You never just say, I'm just going to do something. No, you need to ask God, what do you want me to do? Secondly, you know, you can, you, you, you can maybe God's leading you to adopt. Maybe that's what you need to do. I would talk to, to, to Hector and, and Vicky after the service. You know, they've got some sheets and stuff on, on adoption. Maybe God's leading you to foster. Maybe you're going to be on the front lines, and you're willing to take the call at 3 in the morning. Says, okay, somebody's in trouble. I will put on my cape and I will go get them. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. But see, every time we participate in this activity, we got to remember, like I said to you guys, we're participating in a holy illustration of who God, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every, every act is an opportunity. I think it would be awesome, awesome. If someone entered into that, God called them into that, it would be so cool to be able to say, look, when someone looks at you and goes, why are you taking care of those kids? That's got to be crazy. And you could turn around and look at them because I want to be like my dad. And my dad does this for me. Let me tell you who God is in my life. Because you need to know. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you adopted us. I thank you that you created the, the concept of adoption to communicate to us who we are in you and who you are in our lives. Lord, today I pray that if someone is, you're laying on somebody's heart to do this, that they would talk to Hector and, and, and Vicky, and that they would take the steps in the order, in the time frame that you've put in their lives. Lord, I also pray that if there's someone today who has never experienced the adoption into your family, you know, they hear me talk about it, being a part of Christ, being a part of God's family, and they've never made a decision to follow Jesus. They've never understood that, you know, they know that something's wrong. I've never met anybody in my life who didn't know that they've committed a wrong, but they didn't realize that the wrong that they committed 
set them at odds with you forever. And that there was a judgment day coming. But you, in your magnificent love, even though we offended you, you stepped across the line and you sent your, you sent your son to die on a cross and to pay the price for our sin because he committed no sin. He deserved no death. And though death was the price, he paid it for everyone so that we could be adopted into your family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. If there's anyone here that doesn't know that, that doesn't understand that, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they experience adoption into your family. Lord, in your... Thanks for being a part of Bay West today. Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Please feel free to check us out at baywestchurch.org or you can follow us on Facebook at Bay West Church.